Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 35th virtual YMCA education series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. This evening's presentation, entitled Understanding Shoulder Pain, is being recorded so that you will be able to revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your friends and family about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. Shoulder pain can limit everyday activities. Even things that seem to be the simplest of tasks, such as combing one's hair or tucking in a shirt, can be impacted by shoulder issues. Wouldn't it be great if you had a better understanding of shoulder pain and could learn about the newest medical advancements? Stay tuned. I am pleased to introduce to you tonight's presenter, Dr. Ryan Harold, who will be addressing the symptoms, causes, diagnosis, and treatment options available to bring relief from rotator cuff injuries, frozen shoulder, arthritis, shoulder impingement, and more. Ryan Harold, MD, is an orthopedic surgeon with dual fellowship training in shoulder and elbow surgery plus hand surgery. Being dual fellowship trained is rare because of the intense and lengthy commitment needed to attain each fellowship, as you'll learn when I tell you about Dr. Harold's education in just a bit. Dr. Harold treats conditions including rotator cuff tears, shoulder arthritis, elbow fractures, and elbow dislocations. He has also developed expertise in minimally invasive arthroscopic shoulder surgery, shoulder replacement surgery, complex shoulder reconstruction, and elbow replacement surgery. In addition, Dr. Harold treats acromioclavicular, sternoclavicular, and scapulothoracic conditions. He has specific interest in cutting edge custom 3D printed shoulder replacement implants, preoperative 3D planning software, and computer assisted navigation for shoulder replacement surgery. Plus, with his second fellowship training in hand surgery, he also specializes in hand conditions, including arthritis, fractures, nerve, tendon, and artery injuries. Dr. Harold is a local guy having grown up in the Northwestern suburbs. He received his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue University, then attended medical school at the University of Illinois at Chicago and completed both his orthopedic surgery internship and residency at the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He stayed in the Midwest for his fellowship training too, completing a one year hand and upper extremity surgery fellowship at the Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center in Indianapolis, followed by a second one year subspecialty fellowship training in shoulder and elbow arthroscopic and reconstructive surgery at Washington University in St. Louis. We are so fortunate to have him on our team. Dr. Harold's goal in taking care of patients is to provide the highest level of care to everyone, whether it be through surgical or non-surgical approaches, including injections, physical therapy, and bracing. He strives to provide personalized care to each patient, and after discussing all the different options available, he and his patients decide on a treatment plan together. Dr. Harold believes that a patient's specific interests, activities, lifestyle, and personal preferences should serve as a guide to selecting the best treatment. As an outdoor and technology enthusiast, Dr. Harold is an avid runner, snow skier, and golfer, and has that personal interest, as we heard about before, in 3D printing in orthopedic surgery. His wife is a pediatrician, and together they have a three-year-old daughter and are expecting their second child within the next couple of weeks. During Dr. Harold's presentation this evening, you might find that you have questions, which he will be happy to address at the end of the program. Simply type your questions into the questions section on your screen, and I will receive them and relay them to Dr. Harold immediately following his presentation. We, do, we will do our best to answer all the questions that you have, so feel free to type most, multiple questions as they arise tonight. I do ask that you please keep your questions general, however, as Dr. Harold will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. If you do have self-specific questions, please contact Dr. Harold via one of the options that will be listed on the slideshow during the Q&A portion at the end of this presentation. One last thing before I turn the podium over to Dr. Harold, I invite you to mark your calendar for our next IBJI and NSYMCA Education Series <coughs> program. On Tuesday, January 31st at 7 p.m., Dr. Teresa Sasenko will host Osteoarthritis versus Osteoporosis. 
Thank you again for joining us tonight, and thank you, Dr. Ryan Harold, for your time and effort in putting together this program to help us understand more about shoulder pain. Now, Dr. Harold, please take it from here. All right, Karen, thank you so much. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I am. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm Ryan Harold. We're gonna be talking about shoulder pain today. Um, so a little bit of an overview. We're gonna talk about shoulder function to begin with. We'll talk a little bit about shoulder anatomy, including the bones, tendons, and some other parts of the shoulder. And then we'll start talking about some of the common shoulder problems and treatment options, including rotator cuff issues, arthritis, and some other shoulder problems as well. I think understanding a little bit about the shoulder function and anatomy will help us better understand when things go wrong, why they go wrong, and why we treat them the way that we do. So what does the shoulder really do? Ultimately, it positions the hand in space so that we can use the hand to lift, push, pull for personal hygiene, for work, sports, to provide balance to the upper body. The shoulder has the greatest range of motion of any joint in the human body. It's really pretty amazing when you think about it. It's a beautiful balance between mobility and stability. And to do all of this, it has large muscles with powerful strength and also smaller muscles with precision coordination. And that's how come Chris Bryant can hit this three inch ball traveling at 98 miles an hour and Serena Williams can serve precisely to the other side of the tennis court at 106 miles an hour and this weightlifter can lift these heavy weights. So we're gonna talk a little bit about shoulder anatomy now. When you think about the shoulder joint, most people think of the ball and socket joint uh, that's depicted in the middle in blue. But really, if we take a step back and look at the shoulder in this model, we see that the shoulder is really a complex that's attached to the upper part of the chest wall. And it's attached via the shoulder blade in the back and the collarbone in the front. And all of these parts work together to allow the shoulder to function normally. I want to show this video to you because I think it's very important to form an understanding of really how the shoulder works. So if we watch this video, we can see that in order for the arm to elevate up in the air like it's doing, the shoulder blade has to move upward as well. And the shoulder blade and the arm bone work together in this very precisely coordinated effort. It's something we don't even think about. It happens automatically. It's very coordinated and automatic. And you can see that in order to get the arm all the way up in the air, it takes both the arm bone moving upward, the collarbone moving upward, and the shoulder blade moving upward. And between the collarbone and the shoulder blade, there's a joint. And similarly, between the um, collarbone and the breastbone, there's also another joint. And where there's motion, there can be problems. Uh, so continuing on here, this diagram just really highlights um, what I'm talking about. Karen, are you able to see my mouse as I'm pointing here? So if you look at the shoulder here, um, we can see that with the arm elevated all the way up in the air, um, about two thirds of the motion is coming from the ball and socket joint and one third of the motion is coming from the shoulder blade. So I'm just really wanna emphasize that our motion is not just the ball and socket joint, it's the shoulder blade moving as well. That's really important to understand. So now that we've talked a little bit about how the shoulder works, let's go back to this model that we just looked at earlier and take another look. So we can see the main ball and socket joint of the shoulder that everyone thinks about when they think about the shoulder joint. We call it the glenohumeral joint, but there's also this joint up at the top, the acromioclavicular joint or AC joint and the sternoclavicular joint where the collarbone attaches to the breastbone or what we can call the SC joint for short and the scapula thoracic or ST joint. This is where the shoulder blade sits on the chest wall. All of these things move and they can all have issues. These are the list of the 17 muscles that attach to the shoulder blade. Nobody needs to know these, um, but suffice it to say that there's a lot of muscles that are working together to move that shoulder blade so that the shoulder can move together in a precise coordinated fashion. Here again are some details of the shoulder anatomy 
that you don't really need to know, but I just want to outline here how complex all these muscles are, the different angles and layers, and how many there, there are. And this is the reason why we'll often rely on physical therapy um, to help us out when these muscles aren't working right. Next, let's talk a little bit about the rotator cuff. This comes up frequently, so it's helpful to understand what really is the rotator cuff anyway. Well, if you look at the name, um, the rotator cuff is really a cuff of tendon tissue that goes over the side of the arm bone. So this is a picture of the shoulder um, as though you're looking at someone from the side. So if you were to stand on someone's side, look directly at the side of their shoulder, you would see the arm bone that's up and down here in the middle. This white tissue here is the tendon of the rotator cuff. The red tissue is the muscle. You can see that the muscle comes outward. It turns into a tendon. All of the tendons blend together. They form a sleeve that goes over the top part of the arm bone by the ball and socket joint, and it keeps the ball inside of the socket. It's vitally important for shoulder function, and that's the rotator cuff, the cuff of tendon tissue that surrounds the shoulder itself. These are the four muscles of the rotator cuff. On the left side, we can see the shoulder blade as viewed from the back of the shoulder. You can see there's two muscles that make up the back part of the rotator cuff. We can see a glimpse of the top muscle that turns into tendon. On the right side is a front view of the shoulder blade, and we can see there's a big broad muscle on the front that turns into tendon, and the same muscle on the top we can see and that's the rotator cuff muscles and tendons. They attach to the shoulder blade uh, medially, and then they travel outward and attach to the arm bone on the outside part of our arm. So we went through a lot of complicated function and anatomy and muscles, and really these are the takeaways and really the only parts that I want you to sort of come away with, and that is that normal shoulder function is complex, and it requires a lot of muscles coordinated together. The shoulder is really four separate joints and they work together. Each one needs a thorough evaluation and all of these parts need to work together in synchrony for normal function. So now we're gonna talk about some common shoulder issues now that we have sort of a basic understanding of how the shoulder works. We'll start off talking about rotator cuff impingement or tendonitis. We'll talk about rotator cuff tears. We'll talk about shoulder arthritis and shoulder replacement surgery, AC joint pain, SC joint pain, and scapular motion problems. We're going to start off talking about rotator cuff impingement and tendonitis. And yes, Dr. Harold, we can see your arrow. Thank you so much. I have a start of a little bit of a sore throat, so pardon my uh, drinking between the uh, uh, slides there. Um, so rotator cuff impingement or tendonitis is very common. Um, this is where the rotator cuff tendon that we just looked at on the previous slides that travel outward and really encapsulate the shoulder, the ball part of the ball and socket joint, and keep that ball centered in on the socket. Here we can see this image on the right side. Those tendons get pinched, and when they get pinched, they get irritated they get inflamed, there may be tearing of the tendons, and this produces a lot of shoulder pain and inflammation and dysfunction. This is one of the most common things that I see. This tends to be due to either tendon tears or tendon dysfunction, as well as inflammation and swelling and irritation of the rotator cuff tendons. You can see that the arm bone in this diagram is traveling upwards and it's pinching the tendon against the bony roof above it. It's not supposed to do that. And that can be due to a weak rotator cuff uh, muscles that are not keeping that ball centered in the socket. And they allow that big deltoid muscle on the outside of this diagram, which is what lifts the arm up. Uh, if those muscles are not working to keep the ball centered in the socket and offset the force of that deltoid muscle, that arm bone can travel upward and pinch those rotator cuff tendons. And that's really painful when that happens. So here again, we've seen this diagram before, but on the left side is that sleeve of circumferential tendon tissue that surrounds and encapsulates the ball part of the ball and socket joint. 
and you can see right over here this bony roof above it and you can imagine that if these muscles are not strong enough to keep the ball centered in the socket um, or perhaps if they're torn the ball may travel upward and pinch the tendons that's rotator cuff um, impingement and tendonitis well um, why doesn't everyone get this all the time rotator cuff impingement is prevented in the normal shoulder by a well-functioning and strong rotator cuff that keeps the humeral head centered in the socket. And it's also prevented in the normal shoulder by a strong and well-functioning group of muscles around the shoulder blade that lift the shoulder blade up in that coordinated way like we saw in that video earlier. Um, so how do we treat rotator cuff impingement? Well, we treat it um, with physical therapy to create the situation that the shoulder normally has, which is a strong rotator cuff set of muscles and strong scapular muscles that lift the shoulder blade up. So that's one of the reasons why um, we often send patients to physical therapy with this particular condition. So let's summarize rotator cuff impingement. It's a painful pinching of the tendons of the shoulder associated with inflammation and pain. Uh, the way that we treat it are NSAIDs, and by that I mean ibuprofen, Aleve, Motrin, those types of medications if you're safe to take them, steroid injections, as well as physical therapy for all the reasons we just talked about, and less commonly, surgery. In terms of prognosis, most patients will improve with the above treatment in time. Um, let's briefly talk about steroid injections because we use them from time to time in the shoulder and other parts of the body. What is a steroid injection? Well, here in this diagram that we saw before, this red area um, shown here is highlighting that inflamed area of the tendon. And what we can do is place a needle into the shoulder above the rotator cuff tendons like is shown and deliver some powerful anti-inflammatory medication right where it's needed. And the combination of that steroid injection to decrease the inflammation, decrease the pain, and physical therapy to strengthen up those muscles can be like a one-two punch to get rid of the shoulder pain and can work very well. Next, we're gonna talk about rotator cuff tears. Rotator cuff tears is a tear of one or sometimes more uh, tendons of the rotator cuff. And this disrupts the balance of the shoulder. It causes pain and weakness. By now, we've seen how that rotator cuff keeps the ball centered in the socket and that shoulder socket travels upward with the shoulder as you elevate it. So all of these things work together in a very delicate balance. And when you tear uh, or disable one of these tendons, it can really throw things off and throw off this coordinated effort um, to lift and use the shoulder. So here's just a simple diagram of what a rotator cuff tear looks like. On the left side is the normal rotator cuff that we've seen a few times so far. On the right side, this red arrow right here is showing a big hole in the rotator cuff. This tendon has torn off of the bone and the muscle is pulling it back and it's no longer doing the job that it's supposed to do. When we talk about rotator cuff tears, broadly speaking, we can divide them into two categories. Um, we can talk about acute tears. And what I mean by an acute tear is a tear that occurs suddenly. This is somebody that fell downstairs, they were lifting something too heavy, and they felt an abrupt, sudden, sharp pain in the shoulder. They knew right away that they tore a tendon. Sometimes they can no longer use their shoulder. There's a, a sudden change in the function of the shoulder. This is pretty uncommon overall. But when it does happen, we generally recommend surgery for this condition. And the reason for that is because patients tend to do the best when they get surgery relatively quickly. And by that, I mean within about three weeks or so of the injury. Excuse me. Um, secondly, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, chronic rotator cuff tears. These are really the most common types of tears uh, that we see. When I say chronic rotator cuff tears, I mean a tear that occurs over time. This is a degenerative tear. It's due to wear and tear and breakdown of the tendon, and it occurs over many years. These are tendons we have, tendon tears, we have a little more time to work with. 
we could start off with some anti-inflammatory medications, steroid injections, and physical therapy. Many patients, around 70% of patients, in fact, in several studies, um, tend to get better with just this treatment alone. However, for patients that don't get better or continue to have pain and weakness, we sometimes recommend surgery. What is rotator cuff surgery? It seems like most people know somebody that's, that has had rotator cuff surgery. Let's talk a little bit about that. The rotator cuff tendon tears um, do not heal over time, and there is a risk of the tears growing larger over a period of months or years. And if patients have ongoing pain, despite all of the treatment that we outlined above, that's when we consider surgery. This is an outpatient surgery. The people are asleep for this surgery, and afterwards they're in a sling for about six weeks and then start physical therapy. Generally, people are in physical therapy for around three to five months, and that can vary a little bit. How are rotator cuff tears fixed? Um, this is a simple diagram showing um, that we use small incisions and small instruments about the size of a pencil to go into the shoulder, including a camera to look and other instruments to repair the tendon. This diagram in the bottom right side shows that the tendon has been pulled back down to bone and sutured and held in place um, with this device. And that's how we fix the rotator cuff tears. Here's a patient of mine from a couple of weeks ago. On the left side, you can see that she has a smaller tear in the rotator cuff. It's torn all the way through. The tendon is shown uh, highlighted in the red arrow here and here, and that tendon belongs back down to bone over here where the blue arrow is pointing. On the right side is the conclusion of the procedure that I did for this patient. The tendon has been pulled back down to bone. It's securely held with these sutures. There's no more hole and it's been securely fixed and she can start uh, therapy about six weeks from now. Here's another patient of mine. This is closer to a massive size uh, tendon tear. It actually involves two separate tendons. Um, this is really um, a very, very large tendon tear. The red arrow shows um, a portion of the rotator cuff tendon. It has torn off over here. It is retracted back because the muscles have pulled it away from the bone. Uh, the bone is over here, and that's where it's supposed to be attached to. In the distance here, we can see the shoulder socket there. So we're looking at the shoulder from the side view. In the bottom, you can see that there are many sutures in an organized way that have pulled the tendon back down to bone, compressed it, and held it very securely. This tendon's going to heal well, and this patient's going to start physical therapy around six weeks after surgery. We're going to shift gears now a little bit and talk about shoulder arthritis. So shoulder, or glenohumeral, which is the other name for the shoulder arthritis, is an arthritis of the main ball and socket joint. And shoulder arthritis is due to wear and tear. Uh, it can be due to genetics, and it also can be due to old injuries. We treat this with anti-inflammatory medications initially, steroid injections like we outlined before, except those steroid injections go right into the joint in this area here in eventual shoulder replacement if people continue to have pain. This simple diagram over here on the right side shows a shoulder with arthritis. And let me take a step back for a second. What is arthritis? Arthritis is a loss of cartilage in a joint and which results in eventual bone grinding on bone. Um, and that's extremely painful and debilitating. And, um, and it's shown here in this diagram. And so after the cartilage wears away, you can wind up with raw bone of the ball grinding and wearing away on raw bone of the socket. Very painful and um, one of the main things that I treat. So for patients that ultimately go on to have surgery for this, uh, we typically treat this with a shoulder replacement. Um, this is a diagram showing a shoulder replacement. You can see that the arthritic part or the degenerative part of the ball has been removed. It has been replaced with this very smooth half metal ball at the top. There's a stem that secures it down into the arm bone, and there's this plastic liner that serves just like cartilage in the normal healthy shoulder. 
So here's a patient of mine. He's a 76 year old male that I did an anatomic total shoulder replacement for severe painful degenerative arthritis. This is his x ray after surgery showing the full shoulder replacement that I did for him. And here he is uh, three months after surgery. Um, he has no pain. He has good function. He has a little bit of shoulder stiffness. He has some more physical therapy to do. I want him to gain more motion and I think that he will. He's still early on in the recovery process, but uh, most importantly, has no pain and good shoulder function for the point that he's at in recovery. We're gonna change topics now and we're gonna talk about shoulder arthritis, but now with tendon tears of the rotator cuff. This is sort of a whole different type of shoulder problem. We call this cuff tear arthropathy. That's the medical term for it. Excuse me. This is actually fairly common. Cuff tear arthropathy is a combination of rotator cuff tendon tears and arthritis. And the way that this works is people that have chronic tearing of the rotator cuff undergo this sort of predictable pattern of shoulder breakdown followed by arthritis, which leads to a lot of pain, dysfunction, stiffness, and very poor shoulder function. If you look at this sketch on the right side, it shows that the rotator cuff tendon that we saw previously is completely torn away from the bone. Remember, the rotator cuff keeps that ball centered in the socket of the shoulder joint. When those tendons tear away, that ball travels upward and hits that bone above it and wears it away. In this actual x-ray in the bottom right side, we can see that the shoulder is no longer centered in the socket. If you take a close look at this x-ray here, you can see the bottom of the socket is right here and the bottom of the ball is right there. Those two things should be equal. They should be even with one another. This ball has traveled upward out of the socket and it has ground its way into that roof of bone above it. So here's an example on the left side of a normal uh, shoulder x-ray. The red arrow on the left side right over here shows the space that the rotator cuff tendons travel through. Remember earlier when we talked about impingement, just a little bit of narrowing can pinch those tendons and cause irritation. Well, if they tear away completely, then what happens is there's nothing to keep that ball centered in the socket. It travels upward and the ball begins to grind on this roof of bone above it. It is never supposed to contact that bone. These two things should not come in contact with one another in the normal shoulder. So this bone winds up scraping away all of the cartilage from the ball part of the ball and socket joint and leaves a raw exposed bone of the humeral head or the ball part. And that in turn wears away the socket and it really essentially destroys the shoulder. What do we do about this? Um, we also do shoulder replacements for this condition, except we use a different type. It's a reverse shoulder replacement. Why is it called a reverse shoulder replacement? Well, if you look at this diagram over here, we have a ball that has been placed on the socket side and a socket that has been placed on a ball side. So we have reversed the configuration of the shoulder joint. Why would we do that? Well, you know by now that the rotator cuff tendons keep the ball centered in the socket. When those are no longer functioning, we rely on this implant where the socket stays firmly attached and centered on the ball and that provides stability for the shoulder. It allows the deltoid muscle to take over for the rotator cuff tendons, and this works extremely well. Prior to 2003, there was no reverse shoulder replacement in the US, and for patients that had this condition, there was no treatment for it. They were left with a painful shoulder with poor function, and there was just no option. However, thankfully, in November of 2003, um, the reverse shoulder replacement was FDA approved in the United States um, and it had been used in Europe for around 10 years before that with very good uh, results. And so you can see in this diagram that right around the time the reverse shoulder replacement was FDA approved, um, its usage has increased, it's um, undergone almost exponential growth and it is in fact the fastest growing segment of shoulder <clears throat> replacements between hip knee and shoulder replacements. Um, this is another patient of mine. Um, she had really severe uh, left shoulder arthritis with uh, 
tear of the rotator cuff tendons. You can see in this 3D reconstruction from a CT scan, she has enormous bone spurs, and this is an extremely poorly functioning shoulder, extremely painful. And so for her, I did this reverse shoulder replacement. You can see that all the bone spurs have been removed. She has this socket that's on the top of the arm bone. She has this half a ball that's been placed onto the socket and held securely with these screws. Um, and that's how that's been treated. I use 3D planning software. I obtain a CT scan prior to doing a shoulder replacement on every single patient. And I plan each patient's uh, surgery individually. It's almost like a custom operation for each individual patient. This is her 3D plan uh, that I planned out prior to surgery. So here she is. She's a 66 year old lady. She's three months after surgery. She has no pain. Again, I think she has good both, <clears throat> excuse me, good function. She will regain more motion with time. It's very early. Um, she's still in physical therapy. And we know that these shoulder replacements can improve their range of motion up to a year after surgery. So she has nine more months to go. We've talked now about two different types of shoulder replacements. Here they are in a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left side is the anatomic or conventional shoulder replacement. We use that when the rotator cuff is strong and working well. On the right side is a reverse shoulder replacement, and we use that when the shoulder has rotator cuff tendon tears and arthritis. Here they are again. These are x-rays from the last two patients that we saw showing the gentleman's anatomic total shoulder replacement on the left side and the lady's reverse shoulder replacement on the right side of your screen. So two different shoulder replacements for two different conditions, and they both work extremely well. We're going to um, change topics now and talk about uh, something else that comes up commonly. If I have a shoulder replacement, how long will it last and what happens um, when it wears out? These tend to last somewhere in the 10 to 20 year uh, time frame, and that's variable. Um, so I'm going to show a few patients that I've taken care of um, that needed a redo shoulder replacement, which is something that I do. This is a 55-year-old gentleman. He works as a police officer. He had a shoulder replacement done at age 45, and uh, it wore out, and he also had a tendon tear that was associated with that. Um, and here he is three months after his redo shoulder uh, surgery. Uh, you can see that his motion, I would characterize as excellent for his forward elevation shown in the bottom left, his rotation away from his body, uh, body in the middle image and behind the back, very good motion. And he's only three months out. This is a little younger patient with very strong muscles. And that's part of the reason why he's had such an excellent outcome. This is another gentleman. Uh, he's 55 years old. He's uh, six weeks out in this video I'm going to show after a redo shoulder replacement. He had a shoulder replacement done two years prior by someone else and had some major issues uh, with the shoulder replacement and needed to have it redone. That's very uncommon, uh, very rare that that would happen, um, but it can happen and I'm thankful that he made his way to me so we could get him taken care of. And so here he is, he's only six weeks out from surgery and uh, he's almost moving too fast for my comfort. Um, he's done an excellent job with um, physical therapy and I'll show his motion one more time. He's really at the point that I don't even allow people yet to go behind their back. Um, so he can't even do that motion yet, um, but he's doing very well. So we've talked about uh, these regular and complex shoulder replacements. How do we get consistent results? Um, why is this field growing so well and, and why do patients do well? In part, I think the three-dimensional planning that we are now able to do for these shoulder replacements um, has really helped us out a lot. It helps us understand the bony deformity in the shoulder. It helps us plan and essentially do the surgery ahead of time for each individual patient. For the patient that I showed on the previous slide, I planned out his surgery every step of the way ahead of time after I obtained a CT scan using this software. Here you can see me planning out the socket side of his shoulder replacement, exactly what implants and where they go and how they're gonna be positioned. Here I am now planning out the arm bone side of his shoulder replacement, 
the purple is his old implant, the teal on the left side is the new implant, and this software lets me try all different kinds of shoulder replacements to find the best option for that patient before I even set foot in the operating room. Here is the whole shoulder replacement put together. This is the anticipated plan for this patient and exactly what I did for him. And what's really great about this software is it lets me take a look at his motion. And if I don't like his motion, I can make some changes and do all of this ahead of time. And this has really, I think, revolutionized shoulder replacement. It has allowed us to produce consistent and excellent results for our patient. It's something I use in every single patient that has a shoulder replacement. I'm just gonna show one more um, shoulder replacement here. And this is a 76 year old gentleman. He had a shoulder replacement done by someone else um, and it loosened up on the inside and essentially came apart. This is uh, much less than 1% risk of something like that happen. I've really only seen this a handful of times. It's extraordinarily rare. Um, but uh, nonetheless, again, he um, came to see me. We identified the problem, came up with a plan. On the bottom left here, here again, you can see I've gotten a CT scan of his shoulder prior to surgery. I've planned everything out um, that I'm planning to do for him. I've been able to take a very detailed look at the bone that he's missing since things have loosened up. And um, I've been able to do a second uh, revision or redo shoulder replacement for this gentleman. Here he is three and a half months out from surgery. Surgery was on the right side, very good forward elevation. He's gonna show his rotation away from his body is good. He's a little bit stiff there, uh, but that's good rotation. He's gonna show how he moves his arm away from the body. That's good um, motion there. And then he's gonna show his ability to get behind his back this is the motion that improves over time out to one, and in some studies, out to two years after surgery. So he's doing very well, three and a half months out of a redo um, shoulder replacement. Next, we're gonna talk about some less common um, causes of shoulder pain. Let's go back to that model that we looked at at the very beginning of the talk. We said that there's four um, separate shoulder joints, and up until now, we really talked about just the main ball and socket <clears throat> joint or the glenohumeral joint. Well, how about the other three joints? Well, here at the top is the acromioclavicular or AC joint, the sternoclavicular, the SC joint, and the ST joint or the scapulothoracic joint. These joints have bone moving next to the other bones and they can have issues too. So each one requires a thorough evaluation. Arthritis of the AC joint is something I see fairly frequently. And this causes pain on the top part of the shoulder. Um, this sketch on the right side shows a normal shoulder here, and right here is the AC joint where the clavicle meets the acromion. And on the right side, you can see this angry um, joint. The cartilage is worn out. It's raw bone, grinding on raw bone. If you remember that video, you'll recall that when the arm moves upward, the collarbone moves upward and the shoulder blade moves upward and there's a little bit of motion between these two uh, bones at this joint. And when there's wear and tear there, that can be really painful. We treat this with anti-inflammatory medications, again, like ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve. And sometimes we'll put a needle right into that joint and inject a powerful anti-inflammatory medication that can do an excellent job of pain relief. And as a last resort, we do sometimes consider surgery for this joint, and that can work very well. Next is a pretty rare cause of shoulder pain. This is the SC joint. This is where the collarbone meets up with the breastbone or the manubrium or the sternum, this middle bone in the front part of the chest. And there's motion there. And just like any other part of the body that has one bone moving next to another, um, it can develop arthritis there. On the upper right, we can see this angry, irritated uh, joint and then this MRI scan in the bottom <clears throat> bottom right hand corner we can see all this fluid surrounding the joint um, and that's what happens in arthritis sometimes we'll treat this with steroid injections it's pretty rare and occasionally I will do surgery for this and that's a sternoclavicular joint reconstruction um, and that's an uncommon surgery next um, and the last thing that we'll talk about 
is scapulothoracic or shoulder blade problems. Um, by now, we've talked about how just how important the shoulder blade is to the shoulder function and motion. And when the shoulder blade is not moving right, um, it throws off the entire shoulder. So mild forms of abnormal shoulder blade movement and coordination are actually pretty common. They're routinely addressed by our physical therapy colleagues, and they can do a really good job of getting those muscles strengthened up and the coordination back. Severe forms are pretty uncommon. These can be due to a nerve injury or a muscle that's paralyzed and not working well. In this um, photograph on the right side, you can see that this gentleman's shoulder blade is sticking out away from his body. <clears throat> Although this is not a patient of mine, um, he most likely has a major problem with one of his nerves or muscles, and that might require surgery. And then lastly, pretty rare, but people can develop grinding or snapping of their shoulder blade against the back part of their chest wall, pretty uncommon. These are treated almost universally with steroid injections and physical therapy. Rarely people will not get better with that treatment. And so um, sometimes I will consider a minimally invasive surgery to address that problem. But again, that is exceedingly rare. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ryan Harold, and this has been a full tour of the shoulder and, and causes of shoulder pain and treatment. And it was fabulous, might I add. Wow, Thanks, thank you. One, one of the best presentations I've seen. I loved your slides. Um, we got a lot of great questions too, almost all of which were um, or are very uh, general. So I'll go ahead and just start reading them to you and you can answer them as you uh, as you can. Um, the first question says, is it normal for pain to get worse if the shoulder injury goes untreated? It's been one year for me and some days I feel like the pain radiates down my arm. The pain is especially worse at night, so no sleep. It's difficult to answer that. I mean, like we've talked about, there's a whole bunch of causes of shoulder pain. Um, and so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that needs a pretty thorough evaluation. I will say that one of the things that comes to mind um, when I hear people talking about pain radiating all the way down the arm and including into the hand are problems of the neck. I'm not sure if that patient has that. Maybe it's more centered on the shoulder, but certainly untreated shoulder problems, including rotator cuff tears, um, sometimes don't improve um, with time and treatment. And we talked about earlier the variety of um, rotator cuff tendon tears that are the chronic ones, the ones that we have a little bit of time to work with and consider treatment options, really around 70, 75% of people do get better with anti-inflammatories, injections, physical therapy, but that leaves 25 or 30% of people that don't get better. And um, sometimes those people are ones that will um, consider for surgery. And we do know that for patients that don't get better with physical therapy, that surgery can do an excellent job of pain relief um, and improve the shoulder function. Um, I warn all of my patients, uh, you know, if they do get to that point, that it's a long recovery. You have to expect about six months of dedicated time to physical therapy and working on the shoulder. It's, it's really a long recovery. And that's also part of the reason why we try some simpler things first, like physical therapy and injections and medications. We don't want to send someone or put someone through a six-month recovery if they don't need it. But I think that was a long-winded answer to your question, why is the shoulder pain not getting better? It's hard to know without examining someone in person, but um, it could be something like a rotator cuff tear. It could be arthritis. Um, it could be neck-related even. That's something I is really always on my radar. Great, great. So it sounds like, and especially if this person's untreated, uh, it sounds like they need to get themselves checked out and see what can be done. Uh, okay. your, your point there led to another question that I saw, which was, why does it take so long for these recoveries to happen? You know, people come out of knee replacements and they're doing all kinds of things pretty quickly. Same with hip replacements. And this person said, you know, why does it take so long for for shoulder replacements or shoulder surgeries to, to uh, fully recover? That is a great question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, and so for rotator cuff surgery, um, the reason why it takes so long is because it really takes around 
12 weeks for that tendon to be 70 or 80 percent of full strength and it takes six weeks for our body to heal that tendon just so that it's strong enough that we can start moving the arm so really for the first six weeks after something like a rotator cuff repair you're really not doing much you're allowing the body to start the healing process so that the tendon is not fully healed but just healed enough that we can start moving the arm and it's not even strong enough to start lifting things um, so it's really for the first six weeks we're allowing that tendon to start some of the healing for the subsequent six weeks we're starting motion but not even strengthening because that tendon it's really a biology thing it's not it's something that you or i cannot make go any faster it's it. your body has to heal that tendon and then Really, after three months, we're starting the strengthening part, and strengthening after a rotator cuff repair typically goes from three months to five months after surgery. And then I'll just add in that I really want to separate out and divide rotator cuff repair from shoulder replacement because rotator cuff repair is around a six month recovery, and shoulder replacement uh, recovery is typically is less than that. It's less therapy. Got it. Got it. Thank you. That that helps a lot. Um, how how do you determine? Another person asked, how do you determine whether or not it's a rotator cuff tear? Do you need to, to take pictures, MRIs? What what is the determining factor for that? Well, that's a great question. I think um, you know when we looked at the images and the diagrams, um, you can see that if someone has a huge rotator cuff tear, it throws off the shoulder function so drastically that I have a pretty good idea just meeting someone and examining their shoulder. Um, and conversely, when the shoulder, when the rotator cuff is functioning completely normally, it's, it can be, it can be, you know, I can kind of tell when the rotator cuff is, is functioning completely healthily, healthy and, and normally. It's really those in-between cases where people may have partial tears or small tears that are difficult to discern just by seeing someone and examining their shoulder. And so the answer to your question is we use MRI pretty routinely and um, we rely on MRI scans of the shoulder to help identify these tears and figure out how to treat them. Thank you, okay, that makes sense. Uh, another person asks, can someone with a mild rotator cuff tear still continue to do sports like tennis or will the tear grow larger by continuing to do those activities? So we do know from lots and lots of studies that have been done, um, there are specific characteristics or um, shapes of rotator cuff tears and features of them um, that can predispose people um, to having that tear growing, grow bigger with time. And so um, these are the type of patients that I like to get an MRI of and take a very close and detailed look and see where is the tendon tear located? Is it torn all the way through? How wide is it? How retracted is it? How far towards the front or towards the back of the shoulder is it? And um, we can put all of those, all of that information together and give people a really good idea of what's gonna happen if they leave it untreated. There are some rotator cuff tears that are even though they're torn all the way through, they're pretty safe to watch over time as long as someone's doing well. And conversely, there's other rotator cuff tears that have features that will retract and pull away and can become irreparable over time. And, and, and so the short answer to your question is an MRI can be very helpful to sort that out. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, another question, can rotator cuff tears radiate pain up into the neck and into the mid upper arms? Definitely. I mean, most patients with rotator cuff tears tend to describe pain in the front part or the outside part of their shoulder, um, but people will complain about pain radiating up along the trapezius muscle and down the arm. That's pretty common. Um, we didn't really talk today about problems with the biceps tendon or the tendon in the front part of the shoulder. That's another really common cause of shoulder pain and something that I evaluate regularly, and that can cause pain in the front part of the arm and it that travels down the arm. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and another question, how does 
bursitis differ from rotator cuff tendonitis? Those are really one of the same. The tendon, uh, the bursitis or the bursa is the lining um, just above the rotator cuff tendon. It's um, sort of a lubricating type of fluid and tissue that allows that tendon to glide um, below that bony bridge that's above it that, that we saw. And when that tendon becomes inflamed and swollen and irritated, um, it can develop, patients can develop something called bursitis, which is an inflammation of that bursal tissue or that gliding type tissue. Um, and that goes hand in hand with um, inflammation of the rotator cuff tendon that's just adjacent to it. So these two things go really hand in hand. Okay, awesome, thank you. And um, is, is a slap tear part of the rotator cuff tears? Someone asked about explaining, asking you to explain a slap great, tear. Great question. We I had limited amount of time, so I couldn't cover everything. Yeah, of um, course not. But a slap tear is an acronym um, that stands for superior labral tear from anterior to posterior. I wish I had a nice diagram that I tend to show patients in clinic and explain this to them, but we looked at the shoulder socket um, in some of the images earlier. At the top of the socket, the long head of the biceps tendon attaches to it, and then it makes almost a 90 degree turn and travels down the arm. Well, if you look at that socket, it has a cartilage lining, sort of a ring of cartilage type tissue um, that goes circumferentially 360 degrees around the socket. That biceps tendon attaches to the very top of the labrum and that's what anchors it. And so when you're lifting up your arm and bending your elbow, part of that strength comes from that tendon and that tendon mm. is anchored or attached to the very top of the shoulder socket and the labrum. And so what is a slap tear? It's where that biceps tendon pulls the labrum away from the shoulder socket and creates a cartilage tear of the lining of the outer part um, of the shoulder socket. It's really painful um, and it's fairly common. Um, the next question people ask is, uh, how do I treat this? Um, we typically treat this with steroid injections into the shoulder joint, different than the diagram I showed earlier. And I usually have people go and have this done under precision x-ray guidance with our pain management specialists to make sure that they get that steroid in exactly the right spot and they'll inject it and then we start some physical therapy. That can work very well for a lot of people. And then the question is, well, what if that doesn't work? For patients that are younger, we'll often repair that labral tear and that can work extremely well. For patients that are on the older side, we do a different procedure for that. That's a little hard to explain without drawing it out, um, but we relocate that biceps tendon um, and instead of having it be attached to the top of the socket and pulling on that labrum, we'll sometimes relocate that tendon to the front part of the arm and sort of um, completely remove it from the equation so that when you bend your elbow, rather than it pulling on the top part of the socket, it's securely attached to bone and it's no longer pulling on that slap tear. So those are, that's another treatment for that. Very cool, thank you. Thank you, and, and even without your diagrams, Great explanation, so thank you. And speaking of steroid injections, um, someone asks, is there a maximum number of steroid injections that one can receive before total shoulder replacement surgery becomes a better option? That's a great question. And um, the short answer is there's not really a limit, but here's the way that I think about this. If there's somebody, so really the, the problem with steroid injections is that there have been multiple studies in the shoulder replacement literature, in the hip replacement literature, and in the knee replacement literature. The problem is that the more injections that you have, the higher your risk of infection after surgery. And infection mm -hmm. after a joint replacement can sort of be a disaster. We really want to avoid that. So I think it's safe to have one, two, maybe three steroid injections but I really prefer to minimize the number of injections someone's receiving. And so if I meet someone that seems like they're gonna to wanna to have a shoulder replacement in the next several years or the next five to 10 years, um, 
you know, the, the other thing to consider, just to take a step back, is steroid injections tend to work less well over time. The first one works great. The next one works a little less and a little less and a little less. By the time you get to the fifth injection, they're not really working very much anyway, typically. So now you have done five injections. Um, you know, you've potentially introduced bacteria into the shoulder and they're no longer working. The arthritis has become worse. And now we're talking about a shoulder replacement. So if I get someone that I think is eventually thinking about having a shoulder replacement in the next couple of years, I'm totally okay with a couple, one, two, three injections, but I really don't like doing them on and on and on. If I get somebody that has maybe really severe heart problems, say heart failure, and they're just not safe for surgery and they're just not going to be, that's the kind of person, patient, that I feel comfortable injecting every three months for as long as they want to continue injections. Got it. Okay. Thank you. That's super answer. And I'm, and I'm looking at the question. So we're, we've kind of now moved into shoulder replacements. Um, are the, um, should a shoulder slash arm strengthening regime be started prior to any shoulder surgery? I don't do that as a matter of routine, but I think if someone is interested or willing to do that, I think it's excellent. Um, there's certainly no harm um, in getting those muscles strengthened up and ready to go and ready for surgery. I love if someone's interested in doing that. Um, the reality is many patients have so much pain they can't sleep at night. You know, it hurts them during the daytime. They can barely, you know, cook a meal. So the idea of sending them for physical therapy to try and, you know, do some lightweight training is very difficult. But if there's someone that can tolerate it, I love that idea. Great. Thank you. Uh, are there limitations after reverse shoulder replacement, for example, swimming, weightlifting, biking? Excellent question. I don't really put a specific weight limit on patients after they have a reverse shoulder replacement. However, you have to bear in mind it's a metal and plastic part. And so if you do a lot of heavy weightlifting, bench pressing, lifting bags of concrete day in and day out for 10 years, you're going to wear it out faster than someone that doesn't do that. So um, I don't really have a set weight limit. The one thing I really ask patients not to do is overhead weightlifting. That doesn't really seem to be good for uh, reverse shoulder replacements. So the idea of like military or incline bench pressing is not really great. Straight bench pressing is probably not so great either. Outside of that, swimming is fine, golf is fine, tennis, pickleball, um, you know, gardening, um, hobbies, things around the house, um, home improvement projects, you know, working on your car, doing maintenance, um, hunting, fishing, skiing, all that stuff is fine once you fully recovered from shoulder replacement surgery. Okay, thank you. Great answer. Why is there restricted motion behind the back after reverse shoulder replacement? Excellent question. Um, there's actually restricted motion behind the back after both anatomic and reverse shoulder replacement. So with reverse shoulder replacement, patients are at risk for dislocating or popping the ball out of the socket. And that tends to happen in the first six to eight weeks after surgery. It tends to happen when people do too much and don't follow our restrictions. So, and it's pretty rare for that to happen, but it can happen, but that's why the restrictions are put in place. For So for the first eight weeks after shoulder replacement surgery, it's a two pound weightlifting restriction. It's no going behind the back with the arm and it's no using the hands to push up off of a chair or a couch. After we get to eight weeks out from surgery, some of those capsular ligaments have healed and, um, and are healed and stabilize the shoulder. Once you get to eight weeks, you can do basically whatever you want in terms of going behind your back and lifting and pushing and pulling, but we just need those ligaments to heal and it takes eight weeks for them to do that. Um, so that answers your question, I hope. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good answer too. <laughs> you don't wanna dislocate, I would guess. If, if, you, if one does dislocate, can it be popped back in like a regular shoulder dislocation or does it, does it have to be surgically put back into place if they dislocate you know, within that six weeks? Yeah, the rate of dislocation is um, probably around one in 50 or two in 50, something like that. Um, it's uncommon for it to happen. If it does happen, we do put it back into place. Um, and 
most patients are fine at that point. Um, it would be uncommon, but sometimes we do have to go back in there and stabilize um, the shoulder uh, with a relatively straightforward procedure, um, and those patients tend to do well. Um, so dislocations are uncommon after shoulder replacement, and they're also very uncommon in patients that follow all the restrictions. It's, it, it's pretty uncommon to have that happen. If it does happen, we pop it back into place. If it happens again, they may need to have a part of the shoulder replacement redone, and I've done that a number of times um, when it needs to happen. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Um, it, how is shoulder repla replacement surgery performed? And, and the question means, is it a minimally invasive surgery or is it a pretty extensively invasive surgery? Um, it's done with an incision over the front part of your shoulder that's located about here and about that long. So okay. it's about four or so inches on the front part of your shoulder right in this area here. Um, the nice part about a shoulder replacement is that it can be done through a, a muscle preserving approach. So we go through the skin, then there's two big muscles that we just move apart, and that gives us a view of the shoulder. Um, for an anatomic total shoulder replacement, it does involve disconnecting the front rotator cuff tendon um, off of the shoulder, doing the shoulder replacement, and then repairing it back. Um, for a reverse shoulder replacement, we will sometimes do that. Um, so it's an open procedure. Um, it's done through an incision like I described, um, and it's a, something that we do very, very commonly. Great, thank you. That's excellent. Um, someone asked to describe you to describe the post-op recovery for shoulder replacement, but I feel like you've kind of done that with everything you said. Is there anything else you'd want to add to what you've already told us about post-op recovery? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the protocol for the anatomics and, and reverse shoulder replacements are different, and I'll just give you like a brief highlight of them. The anatomic total shoulder replacements, the first one that we talked about today, I put people in a sling full-time for one week. After one week, they can remove the sling at home and they don't need to wear it at home, but I do ask them to wear it outside of the house for six weeks just to protect the shoulder, keep them from forgetting about that they've just had surgery and grabbing something and potentially damaging something. A reverse shoulder replacement, I keep in a sling for three weeks and then I start physical therapy three weeks after surgery. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of the differences. And then one other important thing um, that I'll just mention is that the anatomic total shoulder replacements, they start motion of the shoulder the day after surgery. So at home, we use a device that helps you move the shoulder and that motion starts the day after surgery. And then wow. you go back into the sling um, after you're done with your exercises. The reverse shoulder replacement, we let it wait for um, three weeks and then we start physical therapy. So that's kind of the differences high level of the two. Awesome, thank you. Uh, more questions keep coming in, so I'm gonna, I'm just, I, I saw a question um, about frozen shoulder. Can you explain that for people? Yes, or is that really, just... I saw actually two people today with frozen shoulder. It's very common, um, and I should have probably included it in our slide, in our uh, presentation today, but frozen shoulder, otherwise known as adhesive capsulitis. Um, so I didn't really show a good diagram, but the ball and socket joint of the shoulder looks like this, and it is surrounded by the rotator cuff like we talked about, but the next layer over that, which I didn't really show, is the shoulder capsule. That goes over the entire ball and socket joint. It is a thick, strong structure. It's almost like denim jeans. It's very strong and very robust. And for reasons that we don't totally understand, um, people can develop thickening um, of that capsule. And when that capsule becomes thickened, it restricts the motion of the shoulder. The common classic patient that we see it in is a 40, 50, 60 year old female, but we see it in young men and older females as well. It can be associated with thyroid issues. It can be associated with diabetes. It can be associated with other autoimmune illnesses. And so what is frozen shoulder? I mean, the classic um, diagnosis of that is I ask someone to lift their arm up and maybe they can only go halfway. And when I try to assist them and lift further, it just doesn't go any further. That capsule has the shoulder restricted and it just doesn't go any further. Um, they lose rotation and it's really painful. 
Um, thankfully, it is generally a self-limiting condition, meaning that it gets better on its own, but we try to help speed up the recovery. And we speed that up by a steroid injection into the shoulder and physical therapy. It can take anywhere from three to nine months to really get better. Um, and in a very, very tiny percent of patients, we'll offer surgery too. If they're just not making progress in, in six or nine or 12 months, um, that's probably less than 5% of people that need surgery for that. So 95% get better uh, with time and the things I described. Great, thank you. And and can 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 frozen shoulder be prevented by trying to kind of keep range of motion in your shoulder throughout your life, or is it just something that happens and and you don't really know why? It's really the latter. I mean, people don't really know that it's going to happen to their shoulder, and they don't do anything to cause it in most cases. Um, and you know, not many people get it, so you would you really wouldn't anticipate um, getting frozen shoulder. It's not something I would prescribe preventative exercises for. On a separate note, I think people that want to do cuff strengthening exercises just to keep their shoulder healthy and keep those muscles strong is excellent. But as far as frozen shoulder goes, I, I wouldn't really have someone on a preventative program for that. Okay, great, great. And I'm going to apologize to everybody else who had questions, but it is, it's after eight o'clock now. And Dr. Harold, we don't want to take up too much of your evening because I think questions would come in for the rest of the night. Um, you've got a baby on the way, so I'll let you get home to your family. Uh, thank you so, so much. Really, really informative and really excellent presentation. Thank you to everyone who joined us tonight, and thank you for staying on for so long, all of you who did join us. Um, happy holidays, everyone. We do not have a presentation in December, um, so enjoy your holidays, and thank you again, Dr. Harold. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Have a great month, and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Bye-bye.